Hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Daniel Matura, and I am the co-chair of the CAA Arts Access Committee. I'm a graduate of Columbia College class of 2009. I want to welcome you all to tonight's Arts Access presentation, The Art of Art Collecting with Gregory Peterson. I'm pleased to introduce Gregory, who is a graduate of Columbia College 1973 and Law 1985. Gregory is a collector of note and former trustee of the Aldrich, Con Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum. His collection of contemporary realism has been exhibited at the New York Academy of Art and includes several works later acquired by the Metropolitan Museum of Art and other US museums. He will share his adventures from over 30 years as a collector and give advice on the challenges of art collecting. How do you find a work with personal meaning to you? Is it best to purchase a painting at auction, at a gallery, art fair, or on the internet? And when is it best to commission a work directly from the artist? How has COVID affected collecting? Gregory's talk will demystify these conundrums and more and prove that it isn't necessary to pay millions to build a priceless collection. So thank you, Gregory, so much for joining us tonight and uh, giving us your time to talk about your experiences in art collecting. And uh, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Everyone is glad to be able to see everyone. I'm going to share my screen and hopefully, yes, my first slide is up. Well, my talk is called The Art of Art Collecting. It's called that because collecting is not really, it's not shopping. There's an object behind it. There are goals that people set for themselves um, and many different ways of getting to the um, point that you want to reach. So it is not a science, it is more of an art. Um, we're going to cover these topics, beginnings of an art collection, that'll be my collection, goals and, and role models, where and how to find fine art, how to value an artwork, avoiding mistakes, and um, well, if there's a lot of time left over, we can do new trends and contemporary realist art. Let me tell you about my journey. I was uh, an art student at the High School of Music and Art in New York a long time ago. Uh, I studied drawing and painting, specialized in oil painting. And at that time, I sort of learned what goes into painting, learned um, to distinguish a skilled artist from one who is not skilled. And I've always had a fascinating with the art, a fascination that is. So at the time that I was in school, Pop art and op art were the big trends. And I always thought these were interesting. Um, they certainly got a lot of buzz at the time. Um, I will just share that for me, although I could understand why people would talk about them, they were not art forms that I really gravitated to. I was much more interested in realistic work, historical work, um, painting and drawing and photography that showed life as it's actually lived, things that you could identify with around the world and through time. So I decided that I wouldn't pursue painting, that I would just as soon, you know, make shoes if I was going to do something I didn't really feel passionate about. But I happened to be in Paris one day uh, in December, a long time ago, it was 88. And I was walking through the Place des Vosges in the Marais district. And I was going through this colonnade. And I came across a gallery called Gallery Les Indépendants. And in the window, I saw a series of works by a man named Guillaume Verriot. This is his picture called Les Figues. It's from 1988. And I could not believe what I saw. I never, never could understand that someone would devote the time and energy, probably sacrifice and sacrifices made, money paid, to learn how to paint with this level of clarity and um, realism, especially knowing that painting this manner was not going to put you on the front cover of Time magazine or you know, New York Times arts and leisure section. Um, but I looked at the work 
And I was so fascinated, having just been to the Louvre, I was on a little trip in Europe and been to several um, uh, prestigious museums. And I could not, in my mind's eye, see any qualitative difference between what this man was doing and what I'd seen in the old masters. So this was very exciting to me. And I decided that I would see if I could buy it. Well, it costs about as much as a sofa would cost. So I said, I can always get a sofa, but I can't always get this painting, I'll get it. I got it, got it, took it home, and I would sit in my living room and I would be watching the painting all night instead of watching the TV that was running. And I, and I thought this is very, very significant for me. I'm, I feel very passionate about this. And I decided to see whether I could um, have my own collection and pursue art collecting. So <clears throat> having set this potential goal for myself, I thought, well, who are my, who are my heroes? Who do I want to follow? There's Alfred Barnes, who has a great collection of Impressionism, very, very famous. He's someone you could aspire to be. There's Henry Clay Frick, anyone in New York who's been to the Frick collection, you see his overwhelmingly beautiful personal collection of old master works. That would be great. And of course, there's Lorenzo de' Medici from the Renaissance. He's a very famous collector. But you know, something did separate me from these giants of collecting, and uh, that basically was money, because I am not a billionaire. But meanwhile, I found that there were Herbert and Dorothy Vogel, for example. Uh, they're very famous as collectors. But Herbert worked in the post office, and Dorothy was a librarian. They had a rent-controlled uh, apartment. As a matter of fact, I think they still do somewhere downtown in Manhattan had no children and decided what they wanted to do with their life was collect. And they were very, very interested in the trends of the day. So conceptualism, op art, uh, op art, pop art, all those things were things that really turned them on. So they would go to the galleries and they would go off the beaten track, finding whatever they want to find. And they collected hundreds and hundreds of works and became very well known and their collection is valued well over a billion dollars by the time they were done. Uh, uh, most of it was donated to the Smithsonian in Washington. Uh, and they are um, quite famous. They, they got um, <clears throat> sort of a life stipend from the uh, Smithsonian uh, so they could go, go on living because they didn't have any money in retirement. They were just putting it all into paintings. But uh, they decided to stay in the same apartment and keep on collecting. So I think they're still doing it. Herb and Dorothy. If you're interested in them, then you can see this film that was made called Herb and Dorothy, all about them and their collection. I find it inspiring. Another collector who um, I found inspiring was Gertrude Stein. She was very big in Cubism. And you can see photographs in her apartment of Picassos and Matisses and and um, Brock's and all these people uh, that she was able to get at very you know, reasonable uh, prices for the day. Uh, and if you read her biography, actually it's an autobiography, she'll talk about having Picasso in her apartment and, and he, I think he had a feud with Matisse. It was, it's all very funny, um, but also very exciting if, if you're a collector. I think that was sort of what I would hope to be able to do for myself and, and the sort of adventure I might have as a collector. So what is collecting? What is a collection? Good question to start off with. So a collection, as defined in dictionary.com, is a group of objects or amount of material accumulated in one location, especially for some purpose or as a result of some process. So collect, a collection of notes always has a theme. There's always a unifying um, quality to the works that help to illuminate the time that they were doing it, the, per, the personality of the person collecting, um, what was going on in the art world or in history at that, at that moment. Every single great collection will have that behind it. So it's not just shopping and getting this or that because you know, so for whatever reason you like it.
So why? Why would you do this? Well, a lot of people collect for social liquidity. Um, get a new painting. Uh, easy to invite people over to your place to see it. Uh, become a collector. You meet other collectors. Um, get to know artists and things like that. Art collecting is great for that. People love it for that reason. Prestige, well, if you are lucky enough to uh, form a good collection or have worked by notable artists, then you can have, you know, sort of bask in the reflected glory of their artwork. Investment, some people invest in art. Well, I'm here to tell you that I do not see art as uh, a financial instrument. As I say, plenty of people do. Um, plenty of people with lots of money will buy an, uh, an artwork from um, a blue ribbon artist and just put it in a vault and sell it 10 years later, hope they'll get more money or at least not lose any money. Um, I, I speak to people who are interested in the aesthetics of art, who value living with art, not investing in art. However, if anyone in our audience tonight wants to know, you know, what do you do? How do you get a work for $10,000 a day that'll be worth 50 tomorrow? Or a million today that's not gonna lose money? Um, take a look at this BBC production, The Banker's Guide to Art. It's full of very good tips that I will not be covering. Passion, yes. Well, if, if being with, living with art and being in the art world, knowing artists, uh, is a passion of yours, that's the very best reason to collect art. Collect it because you really want to, collect it because you have to. Okay, so how do you do it? Um, you have to educate yourself as to what's going on. You have to know what's out there in order to be able to collect it. Uh, when I started, I started you know, reading magazines and here's a collection of um, an assortment of magazines which I referred to at the time that are still being published. Art and Auction, Art and Antiques, Fine Art Connoisseur, Art Now Gallery Guide. So the first three are monthly um, periodicals uh, specializing in certain segments of the uh, art world, contemporary art world. Art and Antiques will also include older artworks and furnishings. Fine Art Connoisseur is mostly a uh, very traditional, realistic, very sort of conservative type of art. Anyway, um, magazines will specialize, will have a certain taste and a certain angle. And you, if you identify with that, you should follow that. Art Now Gallery Guide is a, a sort of a booklet size publication that's published in every major city. It'll show you where all the galleries are, there are maps, so there'll be ads from all the galleries showing who is being displayed at any given month. And um, so that's very, very handy if you turn up someplace and you wanna walk around town uh, looking at galleries. And then there are exhibition catalogs, Sotheby's, um, Christie's, um, anyone who has an exhibition museum, they will also publish the works and have uh, descriptions of them and background on the works. So those are good places to get information. These are the venues, the places you can go to to see art and be with art. Um, and this is a list of the venues and the importance um, for gaining information when I started 30 years ago. First, the galleries, auction houses, art fairs, art institutions, studio visits, and the internet. Well, over all this time, the internet has become the most important place to get information. Uh, you will find that every gallery has a website. Many, many individual artists will show their own work there. Uh, I have to say it used to be, well, really, really difficult to reach an individual artist. Um, if you were showing at a gallery, the galleries were not really uh, forthcoming if you wanted to send a letter to that artist yourself. But now they've got their own, you know, Instagram and um, Facebook and regular internet pages so you can 
reach out to them directly through the internet, as well as the galleries and other collectors. This is artnet.com, which is an online magazine, covers mostly contemporary work, but others as well. Um, here is an example of uh, the Forum Gallery's website. Uh, this is a painting a day. Uh, Dwayne Kaiser is the artist. He lives in um, Richmond, Virginia, and he started a website for himself. He was painting a different painting every single day and selling it for $100 to the first person who called up. Uh, and he, it was like a lost leader experiment and it was very successful with him. I was introduced to him by another artist who thought he was doing a great job. Well, anyway, I wound up getting a lot through him. Um, and his work costs a bit more than that these days. Um, this is uh, my own website. If you want to take a look at my collection, the Peterson collection, uh, I've got, well, actually I haven't updated, I have to say, for quite a while. But I have maybe 100, 150 works on this website. And that is the URL. Okay, so after the internet, art fairs. They um, really started coming into their own in the 90s. And each art fair will have its own angle, its own uh, subject matter, maybe its own um, locality that it specializes in, sometimes even its own price point. Uh, but the great thing about art fairs is that they generally will take over a big convention center and they'll invite 100 or 200 different galleries to um, rent booths and show the work that they are showing in their gallery. And instead of you know, going to a city and marching around town, seeing all the galleries, the galleries all come to you. And you can spend, I generally take about four hours for the Army Art Fair, for example, and walk all around, see everything. And I only note those things which are of interest to me. So that's gonna be maybe 0.05% of what they're showing. But that way I know that I've seen all the important galleries, I've seen everyone new that they're showing, and I can start following that person. Um, here's a list of art fairs that are currently going. Um, art Basel, Basel Miami. Now Miami is canceled because of COVID, and I believe Basel did as well. The, that's generally in December, so it will be coming up in a couple of weeks if it were on. But there are satellite galleries that go on in Miami um, during that time, and some of them are actually going to be open. TFAF is an acronym for the European Fine Art Fair. Um, they were first, they first called themselves Maastricht because they were in the Netherlands, um, the only big fair there, but now they call themselves the European Fine Art Fair. They have also an edition in New York City which is without a doubt the most polished, the most refined, uh, the most sort of transcendent experience you can have at an art fair, it's Maastricht, in my, my uh, estimation. Art Dealers Association of America is another very fine fair, but it's you know, only art dealers in America, but still excellent work. Freeze in London and New York City, very sort of out there contemporary work, uh, and also very pricey. The London Contemporary Art Fair was something that I've gone to, oh God, oh, at least 20 times. They, they, um, they sh have the fair around Martin Luther King Day, which is I think end of January, early February, something like that. It's a great time for me. The, um, the airfares to London are at their absolute nadir. You can go over there for a weekend or a week, make sure to see the fair. And the London dealers have their own aesthetic and it reflects English culture. It's very, very interesting. It's much more sedate than New York. Um, and I appreciate it. The affordable art fair is terrific. I think we'll have a slide on that. Um, they are aiming at uh, emerging artists and emerging collectors. And to be in the affordable art fair, every work that they display can only have a top price of $6,000. At least that's what it was the last time I looked. 
maybe it's gone up to 10 now, but that means you'll be able to get a lot of work that is a lot less than that. Uh, you'll also be able to get some real bargains because the dealers may want to show someone who generally sells for 10,000, but since the limit is six, they will reduce the price to show at that fair. Then there are community art fairs like the Greenwich Village Art Fair. Uh, and in Philadelphia, there's an annual art fair in the spring that is outdoors and um, there are people on stands all around Rittenhouse Square. Uh, excellent, excellent show. And prices are extremely reasonable. So here's the affordable art fair. Um, they've got one, I guess, in London. They've got it in Brussels. They've got it in New York. So you can look around that. And when people are traveling again, check out what your travel plans are for the year. You can try to pick up something wherever you go. Um, now, galleries. Galleries have gone down to third place. Why? Because, well, the internet is with you wherever you are. Art fairs are these big, super conglomerations of galleries. Um, but going to individual galleries and going on a regular basis is a way of learning what their aesthetic is, what the price point is, who their most prized um, artists are at any given time. And then by making a personal opinion, uh, appearance rather, and speaking with the dealers, then you'll be able to, you know, get advanced word on upcoming artists, upcoming shows, um, maybe some works that are being uh, sold in a secondary market through that gallery. Um, so gallery uh, visits are very important, but just uh, not as important as the others. Um, here are a number of galleries that I've gone to in New York on a regular basis that, are, um, that have very high quality uh, contemporary realist work. So the next, auction houses. The great thing about, well, there are two really great things about auction houses. Number one is that two or three times a year, they will have big shows of works from private collections, and it'll be everything um, from the most expensive Warhols and Picassos down to um, an unknown artist bought 50 years ago that's part of an estate sale, that's not selling for very much. Um, they publish um, books of, the, um, of what's on offer for each show. So you have like a little um, guide to, and background on the artists uh, that you can carry with you and you know, keep as reference. But the great thing about it is the works that are on display generally are all from private collections and it's generally hundreds of works. Uh, so whatever your genre is, you'll have a chance to see works that are not in museums, they're often not published and it is a great experience just going to see these works that are in private hands. Art institutions are also great places to get information uh, about art trends and individual artists, uh, but also you can acquire works through many art institutions, especially um, art academies who will have annual shows of their graduate students and of their staff, for example. And some museums will sell works um, by contemporary artists that they currently are showing. So I'd like to show you this one piece. This is a, um, a, a work by Lars Newberg. I discovered that at the uh, at Grafikens Hus, which is the graphic arts museum in Sweden. I happen to love this work. It's made with dry point. Dry point is extremely difficult medium to use. It's just scratching on copper. Uh, and you can't make any mistakes. Anyway, this is called The Horizon, and I love that, and I got that and uh, was able to um, place it in the uh, collection of the Metropolitan Museum. Um, oh yes, Aldrich Undercover. So I was on the board of the Aldrich uh, um, Contemporary Art Museum for about 10 years. And um, 
I imported uh, an idea for an art sale that I found in England. It's called a secret sale. And what happens here is that the community that supports the museum, um, the community of artists, create works for sale to support the museum. And they're typically all the same size and they're all sold for the same price, but they are not, the artists are not identified. The people who created them, their names are only on the backs of the work. So you have to choose what you want just because you like it, not because you think someone very famous did it. And there will be included among all these works, several works by extremely famous artists and that the person who's lucky enough gets it pays say $400 for work and walks away with a work that may be worth you know, multiple tens of thousands of dollars. Anyway, it's kind of exciting to do this. So the Aldrich Museum may still be doing this. The first one we did was in 2006 and they do, do it from time to time. This is a list of all the artists who were shown in the first year. Faith Ringgold, now you can see her at MoMA. Um, who else? Uh, well, I, the list is, well, there's a lot of people here. Um, and there were a lot of very famous people in that show. Studio visits. Okay, studio visits, um, they're lowest on the list because they're the hardest to achieve. I mean, you need to know the artist and have some sort of entree. Uh, so, um, and then of course, when you're there, you can deal directly with the artist unless they have an exclusive deal with their gallery. Hopefully they do, but if they don't, then they be able to sell directly to you, which would save a lot. Oh yeah, galleries, here's, here's a tip on galleries. Um, galleries commissions are 50% generally. So if you get a work for $10,000, the gallery keeps five. Uh, that sounds kind of high, but you know what? Running a gallery is extremely expensive uh, to do. And, uh, and it's, they definitely do earn the money and it's worth paying them so they can keep in business and keep the artists' uh, careers going. And also so that they can invest in that artist and increase the value of their work. Um, however, if an artist does not have a gallery, um, or they're between galleries or something, or something like that, then that might be an opportunity to get something and not have to pay the commission. Um, okay, here's another venue, Portraits Inc. Let's say you want to have a portrait of anyone, a business associate or your daughter or wife or something like that, and you don't know what to do. Portraits Inc. is a company in New York that um, serves as an agent for artists who are very gifted at doing uh, portraits. So here is one, Mr. Mitt Romney, uh, that was commissioned through Portraits Inc. Unfortunately, I don't know the name of the artist. Um, but here is another one. This sort of they they tend to do very um, conservative work, but the sort of thing that you probably want for your mother or wife or child. Um, I have worked directly with artists to get commissions. Now this is. Um, a commission of my my niece, my goddaughter, uh, Monroe, when she was five. Um, and I found the artist through an ad at, at the Columbia Barnard um, Journal, or I, I guess it was The Spectator or some, something like that. She was advertising there and I, I dealt directly with her. Later on, this is Monroe when she was in her early 20s. Um, and that was done by Damon Lair, who is an artist I got to know through going to art fairs. And uh, I actually commissioned him to do this painting of Salome with the head of John the Baptist. That's a great thing about doing commissions is that if you want a certain thing that's not out there in the market, you can have it done for you. Um, so I wanted to have the type of Frick-like collection that had historical and biblical scenes, and I never found any in, at art galleries, and so I had this one done. Okay, valuation. Valuation, <laughs> it's, a, it's very subjective, let's put it that way. Um, how can you tell what a certain work is, is worth? Well, here are the elements that go into it. The school. 
each artist works at a certain period in a certain locality and sometimes in a certain mode and those attributes are either in fashion or out of fashion get a lot of money or don't so the school that an, a, an individual artist works in and its popularity will be an element that, that helps to determine the price the artist him or herself um, each artist actually is its own market and just because one person is painting in in the cubist style doesn't mean that he's going to sell for the same multiple of millions that Picasso or Brock did when they were painting in cubism. But a cubist work from that period will be valued differently from say a post-impressionist work done at the same time. Um, here is an interesting example. This is uh, a male nude that um, I found in Amsterdam. This is one which was on sale at a gallery in New York by Paul Cadmus. Uh, if you look at them, they look to be like the same general subject matter, their works on paper, roughly the same size. And how could you tell what they were worth? Well, this one was $15, the Alexei Polyakov, and the Paul Cadmus would be worth $30,000. So what really does determine what's going to you know, be the price of a work? Well, basically, it's all market driven. Uh, the art world is completely unregulated. So it's all what can you get for the work? If there's more than one person out there who wants to pay a certain amount, then you have your price. If no one out there wants to pay it, then you have no price. Um, and it really sort of is as simple as that. So the period, I think we discussed that. The subject matter, of course, if you have a painting of a very specific historical event or a very famous movie star, it's going to command a higher um, price than something that's not very famous. The medium, well, that's interesting. The same person painting on uh, an oil on paper um, gets less than if he done it on canvas. Works on paper are cheaper than works on canvas. Don't ask me why, but that's it. Size uh, also matters. So if you get a small work, it's generally less expensive than a larger work by the same artist, if all things being equal. However, it can also um, sort of backfire. This is a Marc Chagall that was sold at, at uh, Sotheby's for about $15 million, and it is a 10 foot wide painting. This is a work by Marc Chagall, um, which was a backdrop for the Magic Flute, which is used at the Metropolitan Opera. You can see it as it's um, one of its drops here, uh, actually in situ with the Met. And that is expected to sell for $250,000 to $500,000 because Quite frankly, who's got the space for work like that? Rarity is very important in determining value of a work, especially when it comes to multiple. So if you get a photograph or a print and the artist says that it's one out of a series of six, that's most likely going to be more important and um, command a higher price than a print that is like one out of 100 or one out of 200, which you can see. So if you go to a gallery and you see that your print is number one out of 300, you can pretty much well count on never getting any more than you pay for it. Provenance also goes to uh, influence the price of a piece. Provenance means who owned it, where did it come from? Um, if it came from the estate of Jackie Kennedy, is going to command more than the identical piece that was from an unknown person. Uh, if it comes from the estate of the artist, it's going to have you know, less issues with authenticity and um, it will probably command a higher price than a work that's been out in the market for a long time. Um, if a museum has owned it, then that probably will increase the value. Uh, for one thing, if you're getting historical works, 
you want to make sure that you can track the chain of ownership from the artist's easel through the gallery through each successive um, owner to you. Locality is very important and probably counterintuitive, um, but actually where a work is being sold will influence its price. So an artist who is well known in Pennsylvania will get more for his or her works in, Pens in Philadelphia than in New York and vice versa. Uh, I actually knew a dealer who, whose business model uh, was going to London and buying works by American artists at auction and then coming and selling them in New York at a higher price. And then in New York, he would buy works by English artists and go, go to London and sell them there at a higher price. So where the artist is situated and where the work is being sold is a big influence on the value of the work. Condition is of course Im important. If something is um, not in good condition, it's water damaged, it's, um, it's missing um, part of its part of the paint or um, has suffered other damage over time, then that will reduce the value of the work. But the, actually when it comes down to it, what is the biggest uh, influence on the price? That is what is in fashion today. Uh, and if you think about it, um, there actually is no intrinsic value to any artwork. Uh, it all is just a matter of who wants what. So it's not a matter of the time that it took to paint the thing or the money it took to put the thing together. Uh, you can, or the skill of the work, the, of the artist who made the work, uh, you can convince a person to buy a completely blank white canvas and it'll command a lot of money if you convince someone else that it's worth it. And that's really the, you know, the beginning and end of it. So what are mistakes that can be made if you're a collector? Well, you overpaid. Poor condition. It's not authentic. It's authentic but illegal. You're displeased with the acquisition. Let's discuss these things. You overpaid. Well, you went to a gallery, you saw something on the wall, you paid say $20,000 for it or 2,000 or 200, whatever. And then you find that it's available down the street, another gallery for half the price, you're gonna be unhappy. If you buy something on the internet, for example, or without looking at it or checking it out, and it comes to you and you know, it turns out that it's not in con the condition that you saw, it needs a really good cleaning or something, or it just doesn't look like what you thought it was gonna be. That's gonna be a mistake. Uh, now, authenticity, that's huge. So if you buy a work from someone who you believe is a very famous, well-known artist, a sergeant say, and is hanging on your wall for 10, 15, 20 years, you go to sell it and someone says, oh, well, that's not really a sergeant. That's a huge mistake. <clears throat> and I will share to you that as much as I love historical works, one of the reasons that I decided to focus on contemporary work is that um, it comes right off the artist's easel, basically into my apartment. And the artist is there and he's gonna tell me, yes, Gregory, I painted this. So I never have to worry about waking up someday and finding out that the work that I paid, um, what is for me real money is not what it's supposed to be. That will never ever happen with me. So if you're getting something um, that's historic, you really have to do a lot of due diligence to make sure that it is what it purports to be. Now you can have an authentic work, <clears throat> but it's illegal for you to own it. What do I mean by that? Well, the chain of ownership may not be um, one that's conducive to, to a bona fide sale. Here's a case of Ms. Adele Block Bauer, who is the subject of the painting in the book, The Women in Gold there. Um, Clint painted this, I forget around 1910 or something like that. And uh, the family of Adele Block Bauer had the work in their possession until the Nazis took it 
and then Maria Altman tracked it down and reclaimed it, and whoever the good faith buyers were um, had to deal with her because of the, the way the chain of ownership was, was broken. Big museums have the same problem. This is a very famous crater, a Grecian urn, that the Metropolitan Museum um, purchased, and the, um, the provenance did not show that it may very well have been looted from uh, Italy or Greece or somewhere like that. So they had to give it back. That was unfortunate. So then if you are, oh yes, there's also crime. Yeah, so uh, this is one thing, it's a reality that we have to deal with if we're having collections, that um, the business is unregulated and there are a lot of opportunists and shysters out there and a lot of work, a lot of sales and a lot of business is just done on handshakes and there's a lot of trust involved. So people who are criminals, people who are mon money launderers, or people who go insane can be involved in galleries and, and uh, in auction houses. And uh, so crimes come up. So this is one I was very uh, sad to see, the Sounder O'Reilly Gallery several years back. Um, the owner of the gallery just went a little crazy and was spending millions and millions of dollars every year, but was actually cheating the artists and the collectors who had consigned works to the gallery for sale. And he would sell the works and keep the money and not tell the owners that he'd gotten the money. Well, anyway, he ultimately got caught. And Salander went to jail. Um, I wound up never having purchased anything from him or had been involved with him, but I actually was involved or let's say made friends with some of the associates who worked in that gallery and it was a very, very sad situation. The Nerdler Gallery was formed in 1846 and for, well, you know, over a hundred years, in many, many generations, was one of the greatest um, galleries in the nation for historical works and also for contemporary works. But uh, unfortunately, the a recent um, dealer sort of got a little bit ahead of herself and she started selling works as um, uh, modern works. This is a Pollock that she purported, well, it is purported to be a Pollock this work, but uh, turned out that there was a Chinese guy living in Queens who did it. And uh, he actually did uh, many, many uh, contemporary, well, modern works, I should say, in his garage in Queens. And she sold them at, you know, as though they were authentic. Well, um, she was found out. And uh, I don't know if she went to jail or not. I forget what happened with her. But it was not good for the very August Nerdler Gallery and it closed in 2011. This was uh, a crime that uh, I felt very, very um, close to me. Um, Alec Baldwin went to the Mary Boone Gallery some years ago and saw a painting by Ross Blechner that he really, really liked. He thought about it, he thought about it, but he waited too long and someone else came along and bought it. Years later, he regretted the fact that he didn't buy it. So he went back to Mary Boone and said, uh, could you please go to the collector who ever bought it, see if he'll sell that work to me. So I can have it after all these years. Okay, so we paid $190,000 to Mary Boone. Mary Boone went to Ross Blechner and said, oh, Ross, um, I have a collector who liked this painting that you did years ago. Do you think you could paint another one? I, you know, just sell it to him. So, Blechner probably didn't know anything that was going on, but Boone certainly did. And Alec Baldwin got the uh, painting, took it home, and it didn't really look right to him. And it smelled a little new, like the oil hadn't really dried yet. And so he questioned it, and it turned out, you know, he found out that he didn't buy the original, that it just was a copy. And uh, so Mary Boone served jail time. She deserved it. She's a crook. Unfortunately, these things do happen. I actually had a similar experience. Um, well, I'll go into that later if there's time. So what is the worst mistake 
worst mistake is that you, you buy it and you know after a while you just don't like it and you have to hide it in a closet or try to get rid of it. I try not to like let that happen. Actually, I've never really sold anything. I've got somewhere between 250 and 300 works. Right, well, you should have bought it, but you missed your chance. Like Alec Baldwin, you regret the thing you didn't get. And there are quite a number of things that I wish I'd bought, but I get everything I can when I think I really got, when I've got the funds. Um, and you know, you win some, you lose some. Okay, now I guess I can answer some questions. I think we've had a, a few that have come up. Daniel, do you have anything for me? Yes, uh, thank you, first of all, so much for, for the presentation. Uh, that was really beautiful. Uh, it was really wonderful that you gave us your story and how you started and how that informed a lot of your choices and um, you know, sort of like navigating what is a very complicated world. I feel like um, you explained it with such clarity. Uh, so thank you so much for that, first of all. Um, yeah, we do, uh, we do have a few questions. Um, so, yeah, one, one good question we had was um, about authenticity. So, uh, someone had asked, how can one check the authenticity of an artwork? Okay. Um, so, in general, so. Right. Um, <clears throat> it's a very, very difficult thing to do unless you have satisfactory proof that the work you get is completely genuine. And as I, as I discussed in my presentation, um, well, I'm not a billionaire, right? When I, when I buy an artwork, I've generally saved up a year or two to have the money to get that artwork. And I don't want to see that go down the drain by someone, you know, someone coming along and telling me that it's not authentic. One of the reasons that I focus on contemporary works because the artist is there and they're telling me they did it. I will never have that type of a question. But if you're buying a historical work and you go to a reputable gallery, it's Christie's, it's Sotheby's, it's um, Dorotheum in Vienna or um, some other really great gallery, they're gonna have a guarantee that the work is genuine. So if an, if an issue comes up later on, you should be able to go back to them, they should be able to deal with you, give you a refund or some otherwise, otherwise satisfy you. Um, if you're getting work from a gallery selling historical work, well, they should guarantee the work. Of course, if they guarantee the work and five years later they're out of business and 10 years later you find out it's, that there's a problem with it, they're not gonna be there to help you. So you're gonna want to look at the provenance see what proof they have of the chain of ownership and um, see if you can get, if you're spending huge amounts, let's say you spend a couple hundred thousand dollars on an artwork, or maybe even some, you know, tens of thousands, you might want to go to um, some sort of authority and have them give a, you know, give an opinion on the authenticity of the work. Sometimes that'll, that'll, that'll work. Um, famous artists tend to have committees that will um, assess a work and decide whether or not it is genuine. And as a matter of fact, there is a fabulous series on the BBC. Um, I think you can get it on Amazon Prime and on YouTube called um, Fake or Fortune. And in that show, there's always a person who has a historical work. They need to sell it for some reason. It may be um, a Matisse, it may be a Rodin, it may be something really, really significant. <clears throat> and they are looking to see whether they can make sure that the artist um, that's claimed to be the uh, author of the work actually was. Uh, and you can see them investigating, like a Turner, for example, uh, how many people owned it, what was written in the newspapers about the people who owned it, could they possibly have known Turner. Um, they do um, chemical analysis and x-rays to see whether or not the work 
um, is um, authentic to the period of time that it was done. They'll do breaststroke analyses, all these things. I really do recommend it. It's a highly dramatic um, series. Every episode is interesting. And that'll be an example of what, what you might have to go through if you buy historic work and want to know if it's authentic or not. Um, okay, I guess, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you so much. Is, is Kathy um, a mentor? <laughs> Um, we have uh, another question. Uh, have you bought any work from MFA students? Do you recommend it? I have bought many works from MFA students. I really, really recommend it. Um, because, <clears throat> as I've said before, um, but there's no correlation between the price of a work and the value of a work. And when I say the value of the work, I mean the value of the work to you. Are you going to be happy having that work? Not what the, not what's the general park, public or the market going to say. Is it going to make you happy? And is it going to make you happy enough to pay whatever you're going to pay? So if you find a work that is really, really skillful or whatever the subject matter sings to you and you like it and an MFA student did it, the way I look at it, it's all upside because MFA students never charge huge amounts of money. Uh, you may be supporting that artist and helping to get by that month, you know, and God knows it may turn out that that artist is well known in 5, 10, 20 years. Um, but, you know, to me, it doesn't matter. I pay what I want to pay for work. It goes up in value, it goes down in value. I don't care. I've got it hanging in my apartment and that's what I'm getting it for. Again, I've never sold work. Um, and uh, so the market value doesn't matter to me after I've collected it. MFA students, faculty uh, in art schools, um, people in art fairs, you know, community art fairs, wherever you can find it. If it's good for you, if it makes you happy, and it's a price point that's good for you, then go ahead and get it. So as a follow-up to that question um, about the price point, so we had another question about um, how do you negotiate the price with the gallery? Do you have any tips, any strategies for that? Uh, here, <clears throat> here is one tip I can give to everybody. If you go to a typical gallery for a typical show, you walk into the gallery, there are gonna be all these pictures up on the wall. There may be some in the back that they have in a rack someplace. But for every picture that's displayed, there must be a price list. In New York, it's the law. There must be you know, a list of the work with its name, its dimensions, and what the, what the gallery is asking for. Typically, if you're an art collector, they will give, they will give you 10% off the stated price. So if you just say, well, do you think I could have a collector's discount? They may just give it to you. Um, if you know the gallery, if you frequent the gallery, if, if they are interested in you as a collector, then they may offer a work at a lesser price anyway. If the work, if the artist paints very few works every year, or if it's a sculptor, whatever his products, the product, um, production of product is, 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 is slow. Um, and if there is a waiting list for people to purchase those works, then you obviously won't get any discounts. Um, but uh, as far as negotiating, another thing is tenacity always pays off. Um, works in a show may not all sell. I mean, there's a lot of, well, sometimes you go to a show, the works have already been sold before you get there. And it's just a matter of showing the work so they can be written up in paper, in the paper, the gallery, the artist can have, you know, a show and a party to show his friends and family what he's done or his collectors what he's done. Those works are, are already sold. Um, other, other works, I mean, you go into a gallery, maybe one, work is sold. Maybe one sold and a couple are sort of on hold because people are thinking about it and the rest are not sold. So if you go to that gallery six months later, they may be willing to deal with you. You know, they want to they move the product like, like anybody else. Uh, 
but as anything else, the more information you have and the closer you are with the person you're doing business with, then the better your results are going to be. So just as a sort of follow up on that, and also as a kind of last question, um, you know, you mentioned that you really look at works that speak to you. Um, so I'm wondering just about, you know, but you also have formed a collection. So how do you think about presenting that collection? How do you think about talking about that collection when you have people over or you've made a website? Um, how does that interact with sort of the idea of art history? I mean, you know, in a way you're sort of like an artist yourself, right? Because you have curated this collection, which is a reflection of your thoughts, your desires, who you are, your biography in a way. So I'm curious, you know, just because you're talking about this art of art collecting, how, how do you think about the presentation of the collection itself and how that, that reflects your identity or, or, or not? I'm curious. Okay. So I can actually speak to that in two different, um, uh, from two different angles. Number one, I would say that in my mind, I mean, if I had a zillion dollars, I would want to be a Frick. You know, I want to have the highest quality work. I want it to reflect humanity. I want to show life that is actually lived. I would like people 500 years from now to come along and see what living in New York, living in America, living in the world in this day was like through the artist's eyes. Um, again, um, I didn't, I didn't have a billion dollars, but I, you know, I can go out there and collect work just like the Vogels did. Uh, so in my mind, I said, well, I'm going to have to have cityscapes. I'm going to have to have portraits. I'm going to have to have, you know, hi historical pieces, maybe political pieces. I'm going to want to have Asian people, um, the people of color, women, children. I'm going to want to have a broad spectrum. I want to have 25 still lives of apples and pears, right? So each work speaks to a certain subject, fills, is, tells, is like a different chapter in a long story that I'm telling. So when I mentioned to you that I commissioned the historical work, a biblical work is because I, I felt like I need a biblical work. I, you know, that's part of, you know, my upbringing. That's what I see when I go to museums. I want it in my collection. So I, I created that spot and had, uh, now I've got two um, biblical works in the, in the work, of, in the collection. As far as displaying it, well, um, I have just a two bedroom apartment in Manhattan and there's not a lot of square footage there. And I can only show so much. Um, I was very lucky because my w collection, almost all of it was shown by the New York Academy of Art 10 years ago. And the, um, the professors and curators there assembled the work in a way that I thought was really sort of genius. And when I moved into the apartment where I'm living now, I, I I followed their lead and I put, you know, basically still lifes all together and, and portraits together and um, drawings together. And that was very satisfying to me. But I can never show, I could never have the space, probably will never have the space to have like 275, 300 works all shown at once. Which is why I put up my uh, website because that's a way of my discussing my artists and my, you know, the artworks with people around the world. Um, wherever I go, I don't have to, you know, carry work with me. I can just, you know, pull out my cell phone and there it is. Um, when people come over, I mean, I've had groups of collectors come over and they'll have a, an artist, uh, a certain, an interest in a certain artist or a certain genre. And, uh, you know, I'll just talk to them about how I found it and answer questions and, you know, act as though I'm a docent in my own, uh, apartment. Um, so that's it. I displayed it in the best way I can. I actually suffered uh, a loss when I uh, had to leave a job. I had a really nice office and then moved to another company that was all open plan seating. So 16 works that I had in my office now are in storage. But uh, that's the way it goes if you're a collector. Um, 
The Met Museum has 15% of its works actually on display, 85% in storage. So I've got maybe 30% of my works actually up and the rest around the apartment in portfolios or in storage. You know, that's just life. Um, well, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I think um, we're pretty much at, at time. Um, so uh, yeah, that, that, was, that was such a great uh, illuminating presentation. I, I think that uh, it was very helpful in sort of understanding you know, some of the ins and outs, but then also really appreciating the uh, higher level thinking and the artistic and creative side that goes into um, art collecting as, as a venture. So thank you for um, giving your, your time and, and, expressing, and expressing that. It was, it was really wonderful. To listen to. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity and I hope you all enjoyed it. And if anyone wants to get in touch with me, um, I guess you can go to my website. I think I've got my email address there. Or you can, you know, I guess get in touch with Dan or or um, Patty and uh, and they'll get in touch with me. I'd be happy to talk to anyone. Okay, thanks a lot. Sounds good. Thank you so much and good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>